Guinness Book describes the world's rarest condiment as the thoracic exudate of Lathocerus indicus. This is a pheromone produced by the male giant water bug. For over a millennia in Vietnam, this is one of the most treasured delicacies. And it's, very, it's, it's painful to extract. It takes hundreds of bugs for the smallest amount. When I'd read about this, I became obsessed. I said, I must taste this funky bug juice. <laughs> so I took all the money I had and flew to Vietnam, made a small expedition. And when we got there, it was my first little expedition. I didn't know the language. We didn't have any fixers. So I walked around Hanoi carrying a pitcher that I'd drawn of the bug. And everywhere I went, I'd show people the pitcher. And they would usually just back off and look afraid. But some people just point. And so I'd go the way they pointed. So by the end of the day, after enough people pointed, there we were in front of a small shop. And it was the last family in Hanoi who was still producing ca quong using the traditional method. So I went to the back of the shop, and the owner took out a small box of glass vials. And he opened one up, and he took out a small eyedropper. And he told me to stick on my tongue. And I did so. And as the drop fell from the dropper into my mouth, there was this moment, this, this pause, this exhilaration of anticipation. This was the flavor that I had traveled 8,600 miles for. And nowhere could I find what it actually tasted like until I could taste it for myself. And as it hit my palate and washed across, one thought came to mind. Watermelon Jolly Rancher. <laughs> so when I went back to New York, I, I concluded the expedition with a series of interviews by Dr. Robert L. Smith, who is the professor of entom uh, entomology, University of Arizona. And he said, well, have you tried Meng Da? And I said, Meng Da? He goes, well, that's the synthetic version of Ka Kwong. And he says, scientists, what they've done is they've used paper chromatography to decipher the actual chemical structure of this exudate. And I said, oh, well, OK. And so I went a few blocks down the street and bought some Meng Da for $3.25 and took it back to my apartment. And I held the dropper out. And what did you know? After all those adventures, watermelon mother Jolly Rancher. <laughs> so if essentially the synthetic Ka Kwong and the Meng Da tastes the same, what's the point of traveling 8,600 miles for it? We oftentimes have a very limited interpretation of what taste can be. We often, if I have something unusual I've tasted, the first question people have is, well, was it good or was it bad? When you're tasting something with such a rich historical narrative to it, whether it's good or bad is the last thing on your mind. You're having this shared experience that people have had for thousands of years. Good or bad is, is relative. Sex, clothing, food, dance, these elements all hold the secret language of cultures. And if we just all have synthetic ka kuang, we don't know that language and that world that it's immersed in, that give it meaning, give it purpose. Many years ago, I was looking for a, a humorous manuscript called The Futurist Cookbook by Filippo Merignetti. Now, I looked everywhere and I couldn't find it for the life of me. My girlfriend made the decision. She said, well, for his birthday, I'm going to secretly track down this book and give it to him as a gift. So on one rainy day, she set out and she went to 20 different bookstores. And the last bookstore she went on this rainy day, it was an antique bookstore, there it was. One copy, the bottom shelf, covered in dust. And she surprised me with it. And it was, I was blown away, I was so excited, I called up one of my friends, I said, oh man, you know, this girl, she got me this book that I was looking for, and this story, she was in the rain, and oh, it was, it was just, you know, it was, it was quite romantic and passionate. And he said, oh, she, just should, she should have just went to eBay. <laughs> so at the time, I had no idea what eBay was, and so of course, I go to eBay, and oh, there's several copies of it. And with just one click of a mouse, I could have it sent to my house. I said, it was so convenient, I even debated buying a second copy. But I didn't, because I looked at the copy that she gave me, and there was a value in that book that the one that was a mouse click away would never have. And God forbid I mix those books up, because her narrative, her journey, her intention was infused in those pages. Value does not come from convenience. Value comes from hardship. Value comes from passion. So to this day, when I look on my bookshelf and I see that book, I don't think about the humorous recipes inside. I think about a beautiful woman walking in the rain with my joy as her intention. From a very young age, I've been obsessed with Haitian voodoo. And I've read a lot of journal articles, and I've read a lot of books, but I'd never been to a ceremony before. So I made friends many years ago with a gentleman who was an expat from Haiti who uh, was working at the UN at the time. And one night we got together and he said, oh, a friend of mine, she's a very high-ranking voodoo priestess, and I've been invited to a ceremony. Would you like to go? And I said, yeah. 
So that Friday night, I show up, and I bought a bottle of Bob and Cora rum, and I bought a box of cigars, and I went to pick him up, and, and he's all jazzed up, and he's got cologne on, and I said, I said, okay, I guess it's that kind of affair. He goes, no, 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 forget about the voodoo ritual. Let's go to this, night, this new nightclub in the city. I said, I said, I could go to a nightclub any night. Tonight, with or without you, I'm going to this ceremony. He said, well, I guess you're going without me. I said, well, I guess you better give me the address. So he writes down the address to this Haitian restaurant in East New York. So I pull up, and I go knock on the door, and all the lights are off, and a woman answers the door, and I said, I'm here for the, for the party. And she tries to close the door on me, and I put my foot in the door, and I show her what I have. I said, well, I have offerings that I have to bring to the party. So with great hesitation, she opened the door and lets me in. When I get into the restaurant, all of the silver was actually shaking on the table from the rhythm coming from the cellar. And she opens the cellar door, and I go down. And I'm hit with the smell of people and incense and, and, and sweat. And I hear the music, and I go down the stairs. There's over 150 people in the basement of this building dancing. And there's alcohol fires on the, on the concrete floor burning. And I'm just standing on the staircase, and I realize there's so many people, I can't even get into the cellar area. I'm like stuck on the staircase. The only person not completely dressed in white, just, you know, but I am holding some things. So I, I don't really know where to go or what to do. I don't know a single person. So I just kind of park myself in the bottom staircase. And people take turns looking at me and whispering and saying, you know, who's this asshole? <laughs> so in my head, I'm thinking, okay, part of me is saying, why don't you leave? Nobody wants you here. You don't know anybody. Why don't you just leave? But another part of me looked around and saw the beauty. I saw a woman who had to be in her 80s dancing with must have been her grandchild or great-grandchild, in trance. Both of them looked as if they were the same age by the energy they had, and I saw the beauty, and I said, you know what, unless someone stabs me in the face, I'm gonna stay here on this staircase <laughs> and take in this moment that I've waited years to enjoy. So about an hour and a half later, the door opens upstairs, and a woman comes down in a white dress, followed by a huge ensemblage of other women. And she looked at me and she said, Justin, I am Rose. And I said, <laughs> Okay, so apparently, at least my friend had the courtesy to call ahead and say, oh, my friend's going alone. You might, you know, you might be able to identify him. She so took me by the hand and led me through the crowd, and everyone parted, and she took me to a small chair in the corner and gave me a glass of rum, and she said, you are my special guest. A few years later, I was at her home in Port-au-Prince, having witnessed dozens of rituals and had even in, uh, received an invitation to get a kanzo or initiation into a private voodoo society. If I had left, a minute earlier, if I doubted myself, if I had decided to leave, that entire world would have been closed off to me. All people have wisdom. Oftentimes, we're too busy to check it, to, to really realize that wisdom is everywhere. So often, we meet people, and the first thing we say is, well, what do you do? Now, really what we're asking is, what does society deem you fit to be paid for? Well, I clean toilets at the bus terminal. I clean the dirty toilets at the bus terminal. However, I'm also the last, one of the last 10 people on the planet who can speak the language of my ancestors. I can cure my entire family using whatever sickness they have, using just what you're calling weeds outside of this building, growing through the sidewalk right now. But according to society, what I do, I clean toilets iPhones and smart devices, a lot of times, they're giving us such a tunnel vision that we don't see that the wisdom is everywhere around us. We're so obsessed with it being right here, and they're providing us with a false fix in a sense of this pseudo-digital connectedness that makes us think we're connected to the world, but we're only connected to ourselves. And it's giving us a luxury of isolation that in itself is not a luxury. It's a deterrent from experiencing what's happening here right now and all the nods that we think we're getting with our great omnipotence of who composed the surprise symphony? Oh, I know that. You don't know that. <laughs> Google knows that. <laughs> a lot of the information you're getting is coming down the river of knowledge, but it's going through all these corporate filters. So what you get at the end of the day is information with a tainted agenda. Much of the information that we want is really right in our community, right around us. Many years ago, I wanted to set up an expedition to go to, to uh, that's kind of fun. I didn't make it. I wanted to set an expedition to go to, to Yemen. Uh, Yemen could be a, a beautiful country, much, much mystery, rich history, but it could be very difficult to travel to. So I spent a lot of time running to the, to the consulate, going online, looking for fixers, and I just was kind of hitting dead ends. So at the time, I lived in Pelham Parkway in the Bronx, shout out BX. 
And, uh, and every morning I'd stop by the Yaffa Deli and get a coffee. And then one morning, as I went in, I walk out and I look, I said, Yaffa, that sounds familiar. So I get on the train, I break out my map of Yemen as I'm going off to the consulate, and I look in the index, there's the city of Yaffa. I go in the next morning, I talk to the owner, and it turns out that his whole family grew up in Yaffa, and he gives me all the information I couldn't get at the consulate, I couldn't get online. All these secrets are hidden right in our community. And if I'd been looking at my phone the entire time, thinking I had all the answers in the palm of my hand, I would have missed this great connection. So the final question, can the quest itself for a holy grail be better than the holy grail itself that you are searching for? Many years ago, I decided I wanted to propose marriage to my girlfriend. And uh, to do so in the American tradition, it requires a diamond ring. And, and everything I knew about diamonds was, was one of tragedy and, and of conflict. But it just seemed like something we were expected to do. And if you watch all these particular shows and such, it's banged into your head that this is what you're supposed to do. So I said, okay, well, I'm not against this ideal, but I want to know why. So all my research, what I could come up with was that in ancient India, the diamond was seen as a talisman. A talisman that a man would give a woman, but he would have to dig it out of the ground with his own hands and present it to her. And in that way, it would be a talisman to protect her against sickness and evil and anything that might come her way. I said, okay, that's easy enough. I'll just go to a diamond mine and get a stone. <laughs> and this way, I could ensure that I was buying it from the people who were mining it and not from some big industry somewhere else who was benefiting from the natural resources of the people who actually grew up on that land. So it took quite some time, took a year of planning, and all the time I was telling my girlfriend that I was working on a tourism development uh, pitch for Sierra Leone and Liberia. And, <laughs> and instead of being paid, I was actually sinking all my money into it. I don't know how that really worked. So at the end of the day, I made a great connection in Liberia. I called him up and he said, well, you can't get a diamond from here because we have a trade embargo. However, I have an uncle in Sierra Leone, give him a call. I called him up, I said, Uncle Kay, I'd like to come there and go to a diamond mine and, and personally mine a diamond. He didn't know, didn't make a lot of sense to him, and nor did it make a lot of sense to anyone else I knew, but he said, sure, why not? So a few days before I left, my mother calls. I said, oh, how you doing? And she was a bit concerned about this, as amongst some other things I've done. And she said, amongst her curiosities and her questions, she said, well, if you can't get this diamond certified, how are you going to give it back in the country? And I said, well, I'm going to shove it up my ass. I didn't plan a year to come home without this stone. <laughs> so then I had to spend a half hour that I really needed to plan, spend planning, explain that I was speaking my theoretical rectum and not my actual ass. <laughs> so a few weeks later, there we were. I was in the diamond mines of, well, this place here, Kudo, the Kona River mines. And uh, there I was with the Sierra Leoneans mining. And it was, it was a terrible terrible work that was done every day, and these, these men they were bent over almost permanently, and they had to stand there, and all day they were just smoking these massive blunts just to deal with kind of the, the hardship of this. And now, if you know anything about diamond mining, it takes a long time to find a worthy stone for an individual person. So in the few hours I was allowed on the mine, of course, I did not find my own personal stone. At the end of the day, I was ushered off to a compound where I met sev a, a large group of men in a locked room who presented a large diamond in front of me. And none of these men were from Sierra Leone, none of them were from the African continent. And their agenda and even just the way they carried themselves to me was, was, was dubious at best. And they made it very clear to me that I was gonna buy this very large stone from them. And I made it clear to them that I had no intention of doing so. If I was gonna buy a diamond, I was gonna buy it from the guys who were in the mine breaking their backs all day. So, Things escalated. <laughs> They'd said some unkind things. I said some unkind things. My fixer and driver, who was really the only person we could trust, leaned over and let me know that if we were going to leave, we would have to leave right now. So, as there was a lull in the conversation, we kind of took the yelling out of the building, out in front, and got in the car, and you know, kind of kept it moving. As I was driving away, I was, I was filled with, 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 a, with a very strong rage. Uh, not only that I was at these men's greed and the fact that they were taking th this natural resource and, and the, the folks who were breaking their back in the mine had no say. They were getting paid pennies 
for all the work they were doing day after day after day with no end. And these guys were flying in and just taking the money and walking away, even before it goes to the certification office. So what I saw of the Kimberly Certificate Program was that this is before it gets to the office, and these are the guys who were paying. And I said, God. So I started making a plan to go back with some friends from Freetown and take the stone. As I was sitting there and I was planning, and I was getting more and more mad, I said, we're gonna, we're gonna go back there. I thought of my mother and what she said on the phone. And what she said was, she goes, you're not going there to get the stone for this woman. You're going there to give her the journey. You're going there to do this for her, but it's not about that stone you're getting. So don't compromise yourself, don't compromise your integrity, don't compromise your life for something that's worthless. The thing that is of worth is you going there for her. And as I was looking out the window, planning this, this, this terrible thing we were going to do, that clicked in my head, and I said, and it, and it all really made sense. And I thought about being back there, and what I had taken from the mine was a bag of sand. And I looked at that bag of sand, and I knew that that was of worth. That's when I was in the mine. That's when I had found the moment I was searching for. The rock that was in that room was just a stone. The diamond was in that moment, was in that journey. So exploration doesn't have to be marching across Antarctica. It doesn't have to be discovering a new spider in Madagascar. It's something you can do every day. It simply requires having the passion when you wake up and deciding to be present every morning. And if you see an open manhole, hey, maybe see where it goes. Thank you so much.